Welcome to the Corellis Art Center's March 2022 Salon. Our topic, Preserving a Pueblo's Past with Seeds. And joining us from her gallery in Powaki will be Roxanne Swensel, a sculptor and a food activist. I'm Kathleen McCleary, and I'm a member of the Corellis Art Center's Salon Committee. But before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, IDM, located right here in Corrales, for generously making today's presentation possible. Let me introduce our speaker. Roxanne Swensel comes from a long line of potters and sculptors at Santa Clara Pueblo, located about 25 miles north of Santa Fe. Her first piece of art was a clay dog she made at age four. She had formal training at the Portland Museum Art School and the Institute for American Indian Arts. She's a clay and bronze sculptor whose figures exude emotions and moods. Her portraits often reflect a balance of power between men and women, something that stems from her Pueblo culture. But her works have universal appeal. She's won numerous prizes, including many first place awards at Indian Market. In 2019, she received the New Mexico Governor's Award for Excellence in the Arts. And also that year, she got an honorary doctorate from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Her work has been exhibited in museums around the country, including the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, the Heard Museum in Phoenix, the Denver Art Museum, the British Museum in London, the Cartier in Paris, the Museum of Wellington in New Zealand, and closer to home, Santa Fe's Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. Now, while Swensel is best known for her sculptures, she has another passion. It's preserving the foods that sustained her people for more than a century. She started a nonprofit to collect indigenous seeds and create sustainable lifestyles. So with that, let me welcome you, Roxanne Swensel. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'll stop my video and audio so you can continue with your PowerPoint. Thank you, Kathleen. Well, thank you. And um, I'm very happy to have been invited to talk with you today. My name is Roxanne Swensel. Um, in my Tewa name is Ojegi Povi, which means frost flower. I am from the Pueblo of Santa Clara in Northern New Mexico. Our Tewa name is Capo Owinge, or Place of the Singing Water. And we are the last of the Tano people of the Tewa speakers. Um, our language is Tewa. Uh, I am a native woman, a grandmother, a mother, then president of Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute, which is a nonprofit organization working with sustainable indigenous practices. Um, I always like to start out with just acknowledging um, not just where I come from, but um, where I come from by way of my ancestors. So I'd like to just take a moment and thank them for um, uh, doing what they did in order to make it so that I am here today. And just with all of us, uh, we are here today because our ancestors figured out how to live and survive wherever they came from in order for us to be here today. So I want to thank them for that. I also want to um, thank my mother and my father, who um, is the closest ancestors I have now. Um, my last name, Swensel, comes from my father, who was of German descent. Uh, Ralph Swensel taught the Western philosophy for over 40 years at St. John's College in Santa Fe. And my mother was born in the Pueblo of Santa Clara in 1939 in a very extremely poor um, family. Uh, she survived and later earned a PhD in American studies. Rena Swensel became one of the world renowned writers on Pueblo worldviews. Uh, I was a uh, the second of three children that they had together. Uh, and, uh, and so I was, I grew up in a mixed uh, racial family. And uh, it, I think, affected the way I think and what I chose to do with my, my life uh, because of that. Um, this piece is called Half Breed, <laughs> Two Worlds That Don't Always See Eye to Eye. 
And so I guess I had the feat of bridging this gap. Um, as a person dealing with not just um, two different racially uh, uh, polarized uh, mother and father, I also am in a country and in my Pueblo that has to deal with very different cultural things also. Um, I also think that that you know, all of us are in a time where we're having to think about the future and where we go from here. And um, we're having to choose between a lot of things that may be difficult. And um, so a lot of that is in my consciousness. Um, because I live, grew up and live here at uh, Santa Clara Pueblo, uh, I tend to be focused very strongly on my native side of things. And, uh, and so have kept a lot of the cultural uh, things going as a cultural preservationist. I am not just interested in saving the crops and, and stuff like that, but also all of the things that associate, are associated with uh, my Pueblo culture here at Santa Clara. These are two of my grandchildren getting ready to um, dance for one of our ceremonies. One of the basic ideologies um, or thinking around Pueblo culture is um, centered around community. And uh, we believe that without community, we uh, are in danger of losing um, life life source. And so community is very strong with us. And that's why Pueblos are even built the way they are uh, as, as more of an apartment building style uh, villages that everything is communal based. And it's not just that we are one big, huge family of moms and dads and uncles and grandparents and great aunties and uncles and, and all the way back to ancestors who we still talk to and consider part of the family still. Um, but also of the natural environment. So we're not just people oriented, we are family with the trees and the animals and the sky and the clouds and all of that. Uh, and so I think a lot about like place-based uh, uh, thoughts on, and one of um, the things I think about is because I am from this tribe in Northern New Mexico that was not relocated like many of the North American tribes were relocated to um, someplace other than their home. Uh, we Pueblos are actually still in our home setting. Uh, we were not removed. And so we've been here for thousands of years. And so this place-based thinking uh, is very deeply rooted in who we are. Um, but in a bigger sense, stepping back from that, I think that, you know, as an indigenous person, I'm so connected to this place I call home. But when you step far enough back, I have to tell everybody, hey, you're indigenous too to this planet. And all of us um, were born in, in, in from this earth. And so we're all sitting on our mother's back, in, in, in other words. And so as you know, Native peoples consider the earth being their mother, their big mother, um, I think about how we sit on her back, walk on her back, use her constantly, but not all the time acknowledging it. So this piece I created as a way of uh, reminding us that that whatever we have, whatever we're doing here, we owe some kind of gratitude to our big mama earth. And so that's just, you know, another kind of native thinking. Another thing about that is, you know, especially in these times, in these past few years where it feels very unstable with a pandemic and now, you know, possible wars and it's just a, a very kind of scary time. Um, I realize that what gives me strength in, in times that feel scary is hunkering down to place, to closer to our mom, closer to the earth. And there's a word in our language 
that speaks about having a strong heart. And instead of, you know, in um, having a strong heart being, you know, powerful, or, or you hear sayings of a heart of gold, um, for us to have a really strong, healthy heart is to have a heart of earth, to be closely connected to, to the earth. So strong heart means being connected to our, our earth. So as a earthbound person, I kind of grew a forest around my house here at Santa Clara in the high desert um, because I had learned about permaculture in my early 20s and decided to see if I could in this high desert grow a food forest. So one of the first things was to try it out on my home property here. Uh, we eventually uh, started a nonprofit institute called Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute, and uh, its location began at my house <laughs> in the midst of the forest that was growing, and uh, we began to teach a lot of things. Uh, one of the things uh, we began to do immediately is start saving the ancestral crops of our people um, so they wouldn't uh, go extinct. And why that's important is that species of plants are adapted to location. So given that we're in the high desert, we have a very um, harsh environment to grow crops in. And yet my ancestors figured it out and thrived for you know hundreds of years. And um, so these particular crops are very uniquely adapted to this location. And then not only that, they mean something to us culturally. So each of these um, species of crops actually are considered to be our, our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our brothers. They are part of us. They belong in the family. Uh, teaching permaculture began in, um, in the 80s when we started a nonprofit. And we taught everything from um, pattern understanding, alternative building and energy, high desert farming techniques, animal husbandry, cultural crafts, adobe building, seed saving, food preservation, land restoration, and more. Uh, put out publications when we feel we have something to share in a publication to the community. Um, we've had lots of tours, lots of just hands-on activities for a long time now. Here's our recent board of directors of Flowering Tree. And once again, I, I saw this picture of the corn tied together and I thought it really does take a community to make, you know, make things happen. And uh, I couldn't have done it alone. And so, you know, there's been many wonderful people that have joined in this journey. Here's some of our classes um, with some of the students or interns cleaning beans to the left and mixing lots of mud because we do a lot of uh, adobe uh, structures and uh, then making pots. And um, here's a few more classes. Here's the guys building some bancos out of adobes. Uh, sculpture class, and to the right, uh, basket weaving class that we did last year, which was a lot of fun. Another thing we do is, you know, we, we like to, you know, there's such a mentality now of you, you take old things and throw them away. But I like the idea of recycling and see if you could bring new life into some old stuff. Um, this house we were managed, we managed to get a 150-year-old children's hospital um, back in the early days. And uh, it was falling in, the roof was falling in, uh, it was it was going to fall down. So we took the roof off, put a new hat on it, and uh and restored it. And this is the inside of it now. It's a beautiful space and made a little sculpture for the niche that is a woman kissing a child because I uh, wanted to honor the history of the place and it being a place where children could come and get help when they were not feeling good. 
Another project we did in the community was building hornos, and we called them bantes, but we built over 25 ovens for uh, members in the community. And it was all volunteer help. One of the other big projects we did and will continue probably for the rest of my life is the Pueblo Food Experience. And it started out with just, you know, realizing that the health of our communities was really um, going downhill. We have a lot of diabetes, um, obesity, alcoholism, drug abuse, all kinds of uh, autoimmune and just, just you name it, we got the diseases here. And my son was having some health issues and he's also an historian. And we got talking one day and we thought, we're looking at old photographs of Santa Clara Pueblo and thinking, wow, we used to look a lot healthier than we, than we do now. Uh, what happened to us? And uh, we started to realize that um, it was the food. It was lifestyle, but it was what we were putting in our mouths. And got us thinking about, is it possible to eat the way our ancestors ate in today's time? Um, and part of that understanding was based on seed saving. And the seed saving, I realized, was based on my pattern understanding. In permaculture, we look for patterns. And I was very drawn to the pattern understanding in permaculture because it matched um, the way I was taught uh, in my tribe to see the world, not not by objects, not looking at objects, by, but by looking at the flow of energy between objects, um, between the connections between things. And the more I started to um, look for these patterns, the more they became evident in everywhere in the natural world. And um, uh, these are some nice examples of some of patterns of the hurricane, uh, picture at the top shows a swirling storm, but it's also the pattern of the universe and the way the movement of the stars and stuff go. But we also see that in the sunflower, the way if you can see the spirals that are happening in the sunflower, and it's the energy of the spiraling of the sunflower that is actually creating the shape that sunflower seeds are. So it's not that the sunflower seeds are the main thing is that they are the product of the energy that flows around them. And of course, human beings have learned to use these patterns in such things as baskets and, and pottery and building and things like that. Um, but this pattern understanding made me start to realize that there's connections between things that are important and, and, um, and that putting things anywhere without a thought is actually um, fighting against the natural current of patterning in nature. And um, I had read a scientific article once that caught my attention and it said that it takes 20 generations for any species to adapt to its location. And that clicked on uh, strong for me because I knew that was true as a seed saver. I knew that those plants, those seeds I was saving of those plants um, had to be grown out in a location many times in order for them to adapt to that location, the soil, the sunlight, the amount of water, everything mattered in order to make that crop what it was. And um, putting it into the concept of human beings, I realized that us humans as human seeds are also adapted to location. We're adapted to, um, foods and sunlight and air and community, all of that matters to us. It made us who we are. That's why we get many um, kinds of people in the world. We get 
very light skinned people, we get dark skinned people, we get tall, short, all kinds of people because we actually adapt it to a location for more than 20 generations. So the whole concept of the Pueblo food experience was matching food with people through ancestral connections. So our DNA actually fit particular kinds of food, particular kinds of sunlight, particular everything. And here I have um, to, the, to the left is my husband who grew this amazing cauliflower last year. And I thought it would be him to grow a food from his ancestral past very well <laughs> because he's uh, Norwegian. So those kind of foods come from a colder environment in the Southwest. And here I am collecting some corn, which is one of ours. As Pueblo people, you know, here's some of our main crops that we grow out. Uh, corn, beans, squash, amaranth, wild spinach is shown in these pictures. And um, so these are some of the main things that we keep growing out. And some odd things that we don't necessarily think of as food, but um, they were part of our diet in the past. And um, so even things like um, pack rats and grubs and mealworms <laughs> that we don't think of as food um, were in our food here as native peoples from here. Here's an example of um, one of our meals during our time of eating just our ancestral foods. And the cool thing was that the group of people that we got together in the Pueblo that agreed to eat only our ancestral foods for three months. Uh, we got tested before and after the three months, uh, our health situations with the doctors, and we improved health-wise so incredibly that the doctors um, were questioning if their tests had been wrong because they had never seen such um, improvement in such a short time. Another thing that happened because of the, the, the Pueblo food experience of eating our own food is started to bring back the need for um, farming again. We are farming people and we were losing a lot of our farmers because um, uh, we could go to Walmart. <laughs> but when it became obvious that our, our own food, our own crops helped our health so much, then it brings back the need for um, farming again. It also brought back reasons why we do what we do. And one of the big things that happened out of this was um, we built a women's grinding house. So we built a house for the women to gather to grind corn. And corn is a big, big part of uh, Pueblo people. And, uh, and so once we had all this corn growing, then we wanted to like uh, get it back into the community in good ways. And so um, we built this place and have been uh, gathering now uh, for grinding the corn the old way. Grinding the corn the old way also uh, brought back different ways historically of using the corn. And one of our traditional um, old, old corns is called bua. In Hopi, they call it piki bread. But uh, we brought that back into Santa Clara because of this whole project. And now we have women making it again on the cooking stones. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. And uh, we published a cookbook for the community um, so that people could get started on eating this way if they, um, if they so desired. Uh, so back to, <laughs> back to putting everything together. So here's me on my bicycle grinder in my kitchen, uh, grinding halfway by hand, halfway by, you know, creative <laughs> ingenuity, but I'm always putting my two worlds together. And again, the whole point of, of what I've been trying to do is weaving all these things together. So, you know, you may want to grow out some corn, but, but, but the corn 
also needs to be sung to. So you have to bring in the, the, the singers and then the corn needs to be grounded. And so you have to bring in the grinders and then the stones, the grinding stones need a home. So you have to build a home for the grinding stones. And then, you know, the, the, the house needs to be plastered and then you learn, teach people how to mix mud and plaster. And then, you know, it keeps going. And to think that anything stands alone by itself is false. It's a false pattern. It doesn't exist in our creation. We are connected to everything around us. And so the more we um, get in tune with that, um, the more amazing the world becomes. Our latest project at Flowering Tree was building a greenhouse as climate climate change is happening, we're getting more erratic times. And so uh, we figured a greenhouse might be helpful in uh, getting some crops out um, that might freeze in, er in late frost and stuff like that. But not only is it a greenhouse, it's also a seed bank, it's a turkey pen and a beehive. So we kind of merge them all together because these things go together well. You know, growing crops in a greenhouse needs seeds for this, the greenhouse. And uh, when you grow crops out, I know that animals are very part of, uh, of growing out of crops because they help with keeping the pests down and turkeys are very good at eating grasshoppers. And then of course we have the bees for pollination and honey, so. Here's inside the greenhouse and inside the new seed bank. Uh, also in the greenhouse, we started a hydroponic system to play with, uh, you know, working with hydroponic systems too. And compost toilet that we built with, with volunteers out of Adobe. And it's a nice way to incorporate our waste back into the whole environment to, to help fertilize the plants and help them grow. So once again, all, everything in my life has been sort of putting things together. And here's a Pueblo clown weaving uh, two rope pieces together, just like his stripes, one dark, one white, just like me weaving, weaving myself together. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your sharing all of that with us. It's really terrific. And I love having your, seeing all your pictures and, and seeing the various things that, you, that you're doing. Um, it's time for questions. So I'm hoping that there are some folks out there who have questions for Roxanne about her uh, beautiful sculptures or her seeds, uh, her efforts to preserve a way of life. So uh, write your question in the chat function or come on screen and I will recognize you. Anybody want to get started here? I, I do have one question that I realized as I was watching you talk about your home and the adobe house that you rebuilt. It dawned on me that with your experience and how many uh, things you've done worldwide, you could live anywhere. You could live in New York City or in Santa Fe, but you still live in the house that you built. Tell me why. I, I did uh, build my house that I still live in. I built it at the age of 23 years old um, because it's still a good house <laughs> because it's in the Pueblo, it's home uh, around me. I also then built my, my son a house and my daughter a house and my mother a house. And so we are kind of in a compound a community that that uh, sometimes I'd laugh and I go we're making our own little Pueblo up here by the canyon <laughs> but it's still home so even though you know I could probably move someplace else it would always feel like I'm visiting that I'm not really home thank you I think we have a number of questions I see that uh, Jim and Carla Wright have come on screen do one of you guys have a question if you do you're welcome to go ahead Carla unmute yourself first though please no, you have to unmute, Carla. Always forget that. Roxanne, this is sort of a, a sideways question. I noticed in your kitchen on the table that was next to your grinding bike, what looked like a number of micaceous pottery bowls. Does Santa Clara 
does Santa Clara work in Macacious pottery? My grandmother worked in Micaceous pottery and it's very good for uh, cooking with. And so she would always have, um, uh, and my great grandma, my great great grandma used to have bean pots. So the bean pots were made with micaceous clay because mm. they were good for, for um, cooking in. And the ones you saw in the picture were ones I made that I do cooking. <laughs> oh, thank you. They're lovely. They were shaped so beautifully. You, you might tell us what micaceous potter, what micaceous pottery and micaceous clay is, Roxanne, and where you get your own clay. Um, it's uh, dug up, um, usually um, north of here. Uh, it's a very strong clay that has a lot of mica, and I don't know if you see the shiny mica flakes that you sometimes see. Um, they're I don't know what they are called geologically, but they're they're they have to strengthen the clay and that's what I think makes it so good in putting it over a fire for it not to explode it it um it can handle a lot of temperature variations without falling apart so that's and it's pretty with the sparkles <laughs> so I, I think Deborah you've got a number of questions there I do I do um where do I start I just want to put in a, a, a word of, of uh, encouragement to everybody who's watching that Roxanne, amongst the many things that she's done, has created a beautiful gallery in Pohake. And uh, there's a lot of her sculpture there and there are usually special exhibits and the building itself is worth the trip. It's just... Um, You'll go there and you'll be at peace. I guarantee it. And it's called the Tower Gallery. Right, the Tower, the Tower ga Gallery. Correct. Right. Um, one one thing I wonder: where are you headed with your pottery right now? We see, and where are you headed with the institute? They seem compatible, and yes, they're both time consuming. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Deborah, for mentioning the Tower Gallery. Yes, it's, and if you're wanting to see mica, boy, that that place is full of mica. <laughs> it's a beautiful <laughs> building. They use mica in the plaster of it. So just the architecture is stunning. Um, where am I going with my sculpting? Um, I definitely still have the gallery going. Um, I finished a piece recently that has to do with um, what questioning all of us, including myself, about what is precious to us. Because um, um, my sculptures have always been my sort of three-dimensional journal of life. <laughs> and because I couldn't speak as a child, I actually was given clay by my mother and, um, and started making these tiny little figurines to speak for me. And it became my first language. And I continue to, to speak clay <laughs> uh, on forever, and I probably still will. So when I have something I need to talk about that I can't necessarily find the words for, I, I tend to look towards sculpting. And I go, can, this, can a sculpture say it better than I can through words? And usually um, a piece will come to me and, and show itself as um, what needs to be said. And the recent one about what is precious, because um, you know sometimes uh, life gets you down and you start to feel like, why do I keep going? Or what's the point? Or what's, what is this all about? And, and, uh, and I was feeling that way one day and feeling pretty down. And I was just noticing the little things around me that I love, even, even if it was like the dog ran by and chased the rabbit or whatever, little things or the flower bloom that I was waiting for in the yard. And it's, it's precious to me. And I go, well, sometimes, sometimes it gets down to the very, very small things that keep us going. And, but they're everything. Those precious little things may get us through the hardest of times. It's like the smile on your grandchild's face. It's like that, I can hold on to that and it'll get me, 
get me down the road a little bit. So that piece is about, you know, looking for what's precious to us. Right. Hi. Um, long time no see. I was wondering how you were using your woman's health if you dealt with all your friends. So how are you using that piece? Can can you repeat that question though, Roxanne? Because I think we can't really hear you very well. Yeah, thank you for the question. She asked about the women's house, our traditional women's house we built in the Pueblo, uh, what we are using it for. Um, mostly what the grinding stones are, the grinding stones are in the women's house and mm -hmm. attached to the women's house. We also built the Abua house for cooking that traditional bread in. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a communal house for women to gather in and it's the women that grind on the on the stones but it also brings together the men that sing because the men have to come sing to you while you grind <laughs> so it keeps the songs alive and that and that is another communal aspect to it but the corn that's ground in there in that manner is used for either the the bua the bread making or it's used for the prayers and so all that meal goes out to the community, to all the people that need it for their prayers, because we pray with cornmeal. And um, so we put that, our, our prayer into that cornmeal and you throw it out and, and um, it's a blessing and a food for, for, for what we hold in our hearts. And so it's for prayer. Great, thank you. I think there's some more questions, right, Deborah? Yep. Um, Jenny Dussault, do you have a question? Oh, uh, yeah, this is Jerry. <laughs> oh, Jerry. Okay, it says Jenny. Go ahead, Jerry. All right. Uh, no, I was wondering, um, given the really uh, wonderful results uh, that you had with your dietary study, is that being uh, continued or expanded or even uh, being taken up, that diet being taken on voluntarily on a more informal and personal basis. Yes, yes. And it's also very difficult because, you know, we're in this modern society and it's very easy for people to um, go to town and eat burgers <laughs> or, or, you know, there's junk food everywhere and our community's poor and uh, we don't have stocks of, we don't have storage rooms full of our traditional foods anymore. Um, so it's hard, it's sometimes very hard to get these traditional foods. If you don't have a hunter in the family to go get you an elk, um, then you're left with hamburger, you know, you, there, things like that, that, that will make a difference. Um, but there's been a lot of people that are committed to trying to eat that way as much as possible, um, including myself. And, uh, and my goal is to try to get this food because we already proved that it is really really good for us health wise and spiritually um to get it back into the community and so trying to grow it out as much as we can and gather it into um forms like already ground meal or or um the seeds available to the farmers and any way we can get it to the community uh, is is our journey to try to yeah keep this going. You would like Roxanne to address uh, a monumental piece that she did that is now at the uh, Native American Museum in Washington D.C. and I think Kathleen can put up a photo of it. Yeah. Um, Larry and I were fortunate enough to uh, go to the museum recently. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> And one of the main reasons for the trip, I really wanted to see this because I love that museum. If you haven't been there, it's so spectacular and, and so well done in terms of materials and just layout. So this is, well, Roxanne, why don't you talk about it? Tell us how it came to be. All right, I was commissioned to do this piece for the, for the National Museum of Indian Arts um, at the Smithsonian there in DC and I got to do this wall piece. 
that's mm -hmm. a relief mm -hmm. that um, when they came to me to ask me to do it, I was asked to represent all Native American people. And I laughed because <laughs> I'm from one little tribe in northern New Mexico and every tribe in the in the United States is very different and unique. So to ask one tribe to represent all of the, all is is not really possible. Um, but I sat with it for a long time and I thought, what is what would be a universal thought that we may all have in common as Native peoples? And that was the centerpiece of this um, particular piece, which was um, the spiral uh, pattern of the four figures, two male, two females that are holding hands in the middle and reaching in the four directions. So they're honoring the center point of being um, centered within a uh, balanced place and honoring all directions. Um, so um, the centerpiece is about that. And I, I am pretty confident that all native tribes have that in common. And the two figures at the very end are sort of um, graced on either side by the faces that are rainbowed over to them to represent all the peoples of the world. And the whole piece is considered to me like a prayer for good life for all, all of us. Um, and the two figures at the end are particularly Santa Clara dancers from my Pueblo to, to say, you know, to honor where I'm from because, um, because um, that's who made it. <laughs> and, <laughs> And the, and the two figures, one male and one female, again, balancing this male-female thing that we have to um, uh, make sure is always in balance or else the world goes lopsided and we do not good things. So when it's in balance, we believe that then things go well. So they are forever dancing in a balanced place with all, considering all the peoples of the world in the balance center of the four figures, uh, again, two male, two females in pointing, reaching in the four directions. So we are all, um, we are all held within this prayer for good life. It is indeed really beautiful. Thank you for explaining it to us, Roxanne. Deborah, some more questions from the chat looking, function? Does anybody else have a question? Well, I think there are some in the, in the chat function. So, um, yeah, one from Charlene Spiegel who wants to know where the water comes from for your hydroponic garden. You know, we don't, we don't get a lot of water. And are you saving the water from rain? How are you getting that? Um, with the hydroponic system, you definitely could use uh, uh, rainwater, but it's recycled. It's so I only have to fill up the tub once. Um, and and it, it seemed to me like it would use up too much water, but realizing that it just circulates it with a pump round and round and round. So it actually uses less water than if it was planted outside. Um, we also had a question from Carolyn O'Mara who said that your field was quite beautiful with three straight rows separated by an Indian zigzag design. And, and she said, I'm guessing this wasn't just for beauty, but also for our uh, agricultural design. Can you explain that? I, I learned how to irrigate by straight fields, you know, by irrigation um, methods. But my my field happened to be sloped a little bit too much, so all the water would run down the furrows and bund and, and pile up at the bottom. And so I'd had a lake at the bottom, and it wouldn't get enough water at the top. And I was like, how do I slow this down? And I realized that if I zigzag the rows it would take it way longer to get down the row because it had to go around and around and around and and, and so it, it worked it worked beautifully and so i started this whole thing to like zigzag the the furrows so it was slow and so every time the water turned it would actually even deposit minerals and stuff as it turned each corner and so i would plant the the crop in those corners because every corner it would it would help um, whatever is there grow better with more moisture and more nutrients. Realize that that happens in nature automatically. Rivers don't run straight. They go like this. They roam like this to the landscape. And uh, it actually deposits 
you know, uh, in eddies and, and, and debris on the sides, which are the way rivers deposit nutrients to the, to the landscape. So. so actually that kind of um, information, what you've managed to learn is of interest to a couple of other people too. Um, Chris Wentz has said that uh, they're curious about the research you did on your Pueblo's ancestral crops just to identify which seeds you were gonna collect and, and then how you went about collecting them. And then there was another question, it happens to be, looks like from my husband, Bob Martinez, who says, are, are, are these seeds available to people who are outside Santa Clara Pueblo? Um, the seeds were collected and still are being collected over time. I actually, the beginning of my seed collection uh, began with my grandmother giving me some seed that my grandfather had grown out and it was a white corn from Santa Clara. And, um, and she says, this was handed down. We like, it was, it was our white corn seed. And so it was very precious. And I knew that. And, uh, and then a village um, north of us, Okeawinge, uh, back in the eighties was establishing a seed bank based on their native crops that they were, they were growing out. And some kids vandalized the building and burnt it down. But what was remained um, out of that uh, sad story was some of the seed was left in some jars and they gave up on their project. But I went and uh, picked those seeds up and started growing them out. And they became the beginning of my little seed bank. And uh, throughout the years, you know, you'd hear somebody, oh, my grandpa has some old peanut seeds, or um, we got this strand of chilies, you know, do you want some? And, and I'd always ask, like, where they come from, you know, and usually it's families handing it down to families throughout time. And a lot of the seeds also came from the Hispanic communities, because their corns and squash and beans that they're growing were our originally the Pueblo's ancestral crops too, that when they came, they started to grow out these crops that made it in the high desert. So that was, you know, little by little, you put the pieces together. Um, and by way of sharing, um, I am happy to share um, um, seed with whoever's interested uh, if I have enough, you know, if there's just a little bit, I save it for here, for our communities. If there's a lot more, then I'm more than happy to share outside the community. That's very generous of you. There was also a question from Pat DeVivi asking how you fund all these various projects, because it must cost some money to do all this, even if you have volunteer labor. <laughs> yeah, we get a lot of volunteer labor, but we also do write a lot of grants and we also are a nonprofit, so we take donations. So if any of you need a tax write-off, you know, <laughs> consider flowering tree as, as some place you could um, get a tax write-off, but we would be glad to spend your money. <laughs> Great. And um, Susan Steiner wants to know the hours of the gallery, of the Tower Gallery. Uh, winter hours right now, or I think we're still on the winter hours. I think it's open from 10 to 5 on weekdays. Okay, fantastic. I really encourage everybody to do we, this for we yourself. Had, we had a question from Martha Burke, too, and you kind of uh, addressed part of this, but she wanted to know if the young people are still holding on to the old ways of food cultivation. Because I think Jerry Dusso had asked you about whether or not people were, would eat this diet, but what about the agricultural part of it? Thank you. There, um, there is a slow coming back of uh, interest in farming, um, but but it's slow. It's like, what is that about? Or because they didn't have family members that were farming anymore. Um, they're not sure how to go about doing that. And one of our efforts too is to make small films to share with the community on how to do, you know, just a small garden, a small plot um, uh, in case they don't have relatives that, that, that know. Uh, but there is a few farmers here that I've been working with too that have kept uh, their end of it going, thank goodness. And um, we just keep plodding along and hopefully there'll be more and more interest. Really when the pandemic first hit, 
was the first time I got a lot of requests within the village itself for seed. And I was thinking, well, that's one good thing that happened with the pandemic is everyone decided, oh, we better grow some food. Let's call Roxanne up and get some seed. It's like, finally, you know, after telling them, hey, I have seed for 30 years, they were suddenly calling last year. <laughs> so who knows where we're going to go? <laughs> Great. That's terrific. Any other questions, Deborah? Yeah. You got I it? I think so. Does anybody feel? Uh, anybody Jim, else? Oh, here, Jim, Jim Wright has, Jim. is waving his hand. Yeah, go I ahead, don't Jim. really have a question. I would just um, don't know if everybody knows that the Corrales Community Library has just started a seed library. And mm -hmm. uh, it might work very well and have a, better, a connection of distributing more of the speed, seeds than we just really know about. That's a really good point. I'm glad you mentioned that, Jim, because it is something that's just, it's new to Corrales, mm -hmm. um, but it's a way for us to share seeds. And in my family, I remember that when my grandmother died at the age of 103, one of the things that my cousin gave me was a little packet of seeds of green beans that my grandmother mm -hmm. had been growing for many, many, many decades. So, you know, we still plant those. So it's really great to have you, Roxanne. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm so glad that you were able to share your remarkable art, but also your dedication, I think, to preserving your culture and, and our culture. Um, I just wanna remind everybody who's out there that if you want to learn more, um, you can visit Roxanne's website. It's roxanneswensel.net. And before we end, I do want to thank the Salon Committee, my colleagues, Deborah Blank, Pat DeVivi, Charlene Houston, and Charlene Spiegel. And I want to give another shout out to IDEM. Uh, we really appreciate your sponsorship. And speaking of IDEM, if you've driven down Corrales Road and you've wondered what in the world do they do, you can find out at our next salon. On Friday evening, April 8th, the CEO and creative director, Jim Spadassini, is gonna welcome us at their fabrication facility on the south end of Corrales. And that salon is titled Inspiring Interactive Installations. And what that means, those are installations in museums around the world, 43 different countries, and they're being made right here in Corrales. So mark your calendars. Uh, that's it for the March Salon. Thank you again, Roxanne Swensel. And uh, thanks to all of you who have participated and watched and listened and, and asked questions.